Hi everyone, my name's Jen, I'm an author and a book reviewer and I'm here today to talk to you about all of the books that I read in October. I think I have about 20 books to chat about and I will list them in the description box down below if that's helpful. Quick bit of housekeeping, next Sunday I'm going to be uploading my holiday gift guide video. This is obviously book related and instead of just doing general book recommendations, if you haven't seen one of my holiday gift guide videos before, what I do is I answer gift requests with recommendations. So for instance, if you would like to leave a comment saying, hey Jen, I would love to buy a book for my mum, she loves this and this and this, what would you recommend? Then I will answer as many of those requests as possible in that video. I've already done a call out for this on a previous video, so I already have quite a few to answer, but if you missed that and you would like to ask for a recommendation, you can leave it in a comment in this video too. If I don't get round to answering all of them in that video, I will also be answering recommendation requests in the comment section of that video when it goes live. Anyway, that was it. That was all the housekeeping. Let us talk about all of the books that I read in October. One of the first books I read was Jeanette Winterson's new collection of ghost stories, which is called Night Side of the River. Jeanette is someone I have loved for a very, very long time. It's been a while since I have read a new one from her. I loved Christmas Days when that came out a few years ago, and I did enjoy Frankenstein, not Frankenstein, Frankistein, which is based on Frankenstein. And I would say that Night Side of the River is a bringing together of both of those two books, both Christmas Days and Frankenstein. I read this so that I could review it for Toast. I write an article for them every month, and I reviewed this whilst doing a walk from Canary Wharf through the Isle of Dogs, through Greenwich and Blackheath, which was actually quite fitting, and I didn't realise that beforehand, because this book starts with a story not too far away from that, set on the River Thames, and there are quite a few ghost stories that haunt that bit of the city, which was, I guess, an accidentally good pairing. So, Christmas Days, if you haven't read that one before, is a collection of ghost stories set around Christmas, and interspersed between those stories we've got non-fiction pieces from Jeanette talking about her favourite Christmases, Christmas memories and Christmas recipes. In here we have ghost stories and interspersed between the ghost stories we have Jeanette talking about her experience with the unexplained, some questionable things that went on in her house, especially one that she was renovating in London, and also funny anecdotes about how, for instance, her mum used to pretend that there were ghosts in their house when she was a child because she was too ashamed to admit that they had mice. <laughs> the reason I say that I would pair this also with her book Frankenstein is because this, like with a lot of her most recent work, is concerned with AI and technology. So looking at how ancient ghost stories could be modernised through the use of technology and I thought that was really fun. I was a bit concerned at the beginning. The first story is about a woman whose husband dies and then her sister, as a present, thinking it's a kindness, gets her this app which reanimates her husband and allows for him to communicate with her again using all the data of his that was stored on the cloud. And that was very reminiscent, almost derivative of an episode of Black Mirror and I wasn't sure about it, but then it took a very twisted turn towards the end and questioned what happens if you don't want someone to come back, if you're quite glad that they are gone. So I finished that story feeling really satisfied with it. I will say in this content warning that there are characters in this book who do not respect people's pronouns. Jeanette often explores gender and people's attitudes towards gender in her book. She did that in Frankenstein as well, but yeah, her characters are not always the most accepting, so I just wanted to flag that. I enjoyed reading this book, but I do think that I preferred Christmas Days. So if you haven't read Christmas Days before, then I would urge you to pick that one up. It's definitely the best time of year to be reading it as well. But if you have already read that and you're curious about this, I would say that it's worth your time. Next, I did a reading vlog at the very beginning of October where I was reading cozy to me books. And I will link that vlog in the description box down below. I will whiz through these because I have talked about them before. I read Garlic and the Witch by Brie Paulson, which just made me very, very happy. 
This is the sequel to Garlic and the Vampire, another graphic novel. And as I mentioned in that vlog, if you are looking for a graphic novel that's similar in feeling to Kay O'Neill's work, then this is one for you. I would recommend reading Garlic and the Vampire first because otherwise there is a spoiler in here. Not too much of one, you could read them in either order, but if you're planning to read both, do read Garlic and the Vampire first. This series is about Garlic, who is a garlic bulb, who has been brought to life in a witch's garden, and she now helps that witch tend the garden with her friends and also Carrot, who she is kind of in love with a little bit. In the first one, she is tasked with going to confront a vampire who is apparently wreaking havoc in the local area, and no one wants to go talk to him because everyone is scared. Garlic is very, very scared. She's a very anxious, little bean, but everyone determines that she is the right person to go speak to him because she's a garlic and she has this protective aura around her when it comes to vampires. So that's the first one. In this one, this is more about identity and growing up. Garlic thinks she might be turning into a human and she doesn't know how she feels about that. And she's also tasked in this case with traveling outside of her local area even further than when she went to go visit vampire to help witch out because she needs some ingredients for um, some of her potion making. So she has to go out into the wider world and discover herself a little bit. I thought it was great. I think I actually preferred this one to the first one, or maybe that's just because I'm very settled in this world now, I'm not sure. This is what the illustration style and color palette looks like. It is, I guess, primarily for middle age, middle age? <laughs> middle grade audience. I would say that adults and middle aged people could also really, really love this. Um, I really enjoyed it. Also, in that vlog, I read Ordinary Wonder Tales by Emily Urquhart. I have been a fan of Emily's work for a long time. I really enjoyed her book Beyond the Pale, which I read in about 2015, 2016. I read it when it came out in the States and Canada. It's a non-fiction book about albinism, the history of albinism and its links with folklore, as Emily's daughter Sadie has albinism. So that is that book. And then this one, is an extension of that, but looking at folklore more widely, but also looking at genetic testing, looking at ableism in the medical world and within folklore as well. Instead of being one long narrative focused on a particular topic, this jumps around quite a lot, explores lots of different areas and is a series of essays. I thought it was brilliant. I talked about it a lot in my reading vlog. So if you want to know my extensive thoughts, head over there. That's linked in the description box. But if you have read my book, please do not touch this exhibit. And you would like a non-fiction book in a similar vein, I think that this one is one that you need to get your mitts on. This is definitely going to be one of my favourite books of the year. I also read Spring Garden by Tomoka Shibasaki in that vlog, which is translated from the Japanese, I think, by Polly Barton. Yes, this one I was intrigued by at the time. I like dissecting it and all the imagery inside it, but it has faded for me since I finished reading it. I haven't found myself thinking about it very often. This is about a man who lives in an apartment block which is set to be demolished and all of the occupants have been told that they need to leave as soon as their lease runs out. So everyone's leaving at different stages and he's one of the very few people left. This serves as overarching imagery representing how all of these characters feel like their worlds or realities are being demolished. And whenever he encounters another character and talks to them about their life, he gets this sense of unease, they're living in this temporary bubble, each of them individually, and just bouncing off each other and not really sure what direction they are headed in. And this unease is also reflected in how photographs that some of the characters loved and thought of as real don't quite match up to the thing that was photographed when they're confronted with it. It's like that gap between, you know, language saying a word and then what that thing actually is and existing in that unspoken space and losing yourself a bit. So yeah, there was lots to admire about this, but I don't know. I think, as I said, it has just faded for me slightly. I also read Blind Spot Exploring and Educating on Blindness by Maud Rowell, and this is a 404 Inklings book, so these serve as introductions to a topic, and in this Maud is talking about blindness, she's talking about accessibility and travel and art. 
I enjoyed reading this, but as I mentioned in the vlog, I don't think I am the target audience for this, which is my fault, because this is an introduction to talking about accessibility and disability and representation in media, etc. But that's already something that I know a lot about. If you haven't read lots on those topics, then I would definitely recommend this one to you. And then I also read Some of Us Just Fall by Polly Atkin, which is a new nonfiction book by her. The subheading is On Nature and Not Getting Better. Polly lives in the Lake District and I saw recently actually she's going to be taking over Sam Reed's books which is in Grasmere which is a bookshop which is very exciting she's going to be running that with her partner but in this book she is looking back on her childhood in particular her road to diagnosis lots of unexplained illnesses, doctors being very dismissive. She also talks about the landscape, she talks about nature. If you have read her poetry before or her non-fiction book, Recovering Dorothy, you will notice themes that she enjoys covering and which I enjoy reading about too. She also touches on folklore as well the liminal spaces that you can disappear into as a disabled person, the unseen places going into other worlds that other people do not have access to and from which sometimes you can't come back or if you do come back, you feel like the real world is just not so real anymore. There is this quote here that I wanted to read to you which is linked to that. Diagnosis is like a wedding, not an end point, but a beginning. Diagnosis is a door opening on the rest of your life. And if the diagnosis is correct, when the door opens behind it, there will be the tools you need to make life manageable or the chart that tells you where to go next to find what you need or a whole new world to walk into. This paragraph here, I think also sums up the general feeling of this book. The way we talk about illness and disability dictates what is possible for all people who are affected by it. The narrative odds are too often stacked against disabled people. There are two options that seem to be available, triumphal recovery or inspirational death. There are too few stories of continuation, too few stories of joy, too few stories of the millions of ordinary ways a disabled life may fold and unfold like any life. If you have read and enjoyed Alice Hattrick's book Ill Feelings or Josie George's book A Still Life, then I think this one would be for you as well. I'm carrying one book over into November, which is Eyes, Guts, Throat, Bones by Moira Fowley. This is a Halloween read that I started a few days ago. And this is a collection of stories focused on the end of the world. And they are very magical realist and I am enjoying them. So I will continue reading that and we'll talk about it when I finish. And in fact, I do have a reading vlog planned before the end of the year where I finish all the books that I have been carrying over because I think I have maybe five or six of them or seven, I'm not sure. So I want to make sure that all of those are finished by the end of the year just because that makes sense in my brain. So that will be one of them. So when I was reading that book, I was doing a creepy reads, Halloween reads type video and I will link that vlog in the description box down below. And that actually had a very lovely result of me going to a few other books on my shelves because the books I was reading were referencing either specific books or topics that I knew were covered in books that were sitting on my shelves. And I really love it when that happens, when books encourage you to um, go and delve into a topic a little bit deeper. So I'm gonna talk about that, but also run through the books that I read in that video. But I'm gonna do that very quickly because I spoke about these recently. So I read Seance Tea Party by Romina Yee. Loved this book so much, again, in a similar vein to Garlic and the Vampire. This is what the inside of this one looks like. This one is very autumnal. Again, it's about identity. It's about a young girl called Laura who's entering her teenage years and she feels like she's being encouraged by society to ditch what people would consider to be childish feelings and pastimes, things like play and imagination and basically having fun <laughs> because she thinks that she should be talking about dating and reading magazines and thinking about makeup. And it's about how you don't have to do that in order to grow up. But it's also about a ghost, which is fun too. Then I read The Centre by Aisha Manazia Siddiqui, which I would recommend for fans of the TV show Severance. I'd also recommend for fans of The Subtweet by Vivek Shreya and Yellow Face by Rebecca F. Kwong. This is about a woman who Here's about a place called The Centre where you can pay a lot of money to go and learn a language via basically osmosis and she thinks it's too good to be true. 
it is too good to be true. There is a price that you must pay and it's not explained to you properly before you go and experience it. And once you do, sorry, but it's too late. This is a book that is all about translation. It's about translation as an extension of colonialism. It's not just about translating words, but also translating the hidden meanings of people and interpreting power dynamics as well. So much happens in this book, but I didn't feel like that was overwhelming. I liked how it was difficult to predict where it was going. I, as I mentioned in that vlog, didn't feel like I'd felt that about a novel in a while, one that I was really invested in, thinking this is quite um, a complex setup and I'm not sure where we're going to finish and being excited by that because um, I am one of those people who annoyingly will try and predict the ending of everything at the beginning. Don't watch a film with me, it's frustrating, I know. This is a novel filled with flawed characters who make questionable decisions, my favourite, and who abuse power even though they have been in positions before where that's been done to them and they should know what that feels like. I was just so enamoured with this book, I loved it, and again, I think it probably will make my favourite books of the year. And because I read that, I then decided to pick up Violent Phenomena, 21 Essays on Translation, which is published by Tilted Axis Press. I haven't read the whole thing at all, but I wanted to read Aisha Manazia Siddiqui's essay, which I knew was in here, and I really enjoyed reading that. It, it felt like a bit of an extension to the novel, almost added context to it, and I would recommend this book. I will be dipping in and out of it over the coming months, years. I know that there are essays in here by Anton Herr and also by Karani Baraka, who I very much admire, so I'm sure there's going to be lots of great stuff in there. A book I read in that vlog that I didn't end up enjoying and was disappointed by my lack of enjoyment was Chlorine by Jade Song. This is a book that on the surface I should have loved and no pun intended because it is about a group of women who want to become mermaids and they transform their bodies in order to do that in a very literal way. It's also filled with rage and it's a queer book as well but I just really didn't like the narration style. It's not something that I could sink into again, no pun intended. So this one sadly was not for me. I read Peach Pit, an anthology of stories edited by Molly Llewellyn and Crystal Buckley. This is a book with stories focused on morally gray women, dangerous women, murderous women, scamming women. I didn't love every story in this book, but that's often the case with anthologies and I did like work by writers who I'd read before, such as Disha Filia and Kaming Chang, but I did also discover a writer whose story I loved and hadn't come across before, and that's the best thing to me about anthologies. Her name is Alice Ash, and I have since purchased her book, Paradise Block, so I look forward to reading that at some point in the future. I read a picture book called Lena and the Lord of the Toadstools by Miriam Darman and Nicholas Digart, illustrated by Julia Sada. This is a bluebeard type fairy tale about a woman called Lena who goes into the woods because a young boy, Oren, has gone missing. She finds this toad who lives in a castle, she has dinner with him, he tells her not to go into a certain room in the castle, but of course she does because otherwise there would be no plot, and then it goes from there. The illustrations and the story also have a bit of a spirited away type feel to it. This is one of the illustrations, just so beautiful. I actually bought it because I had read Julia's books in the past and really love her drawings. This one I think is the most spirited away type drawing in here. Um, yes, I love this, would also recommend the book The Lists and also Queen of the Cave, which is one that she wrote herself. The final one in that vlog before I move on to another stack of books that I read was A Guest in the House by Emily Carroll, a queer horror graphic novel about a woman called Abby who marries a man even though she doesn't really love him. It is queer coded from the very beginning. It is very heavily implied that Abby is gay, that she's marrying this man because she thinks that that's what she's supposed to do. And all of these spreads lack colour to reflect how she feels about her life and how unhappy she is. But when she's daydreaming about being a knight and saving a woman from a tower, all of that is in colour and is really vibrant because that's where she really feels alive. The man that she's married used to be married before and his first wife died in mysterious circumstances. There are definitely Rebecca references in here. 
and Abby comes becomes a little bit infatuated with the first wife, starts dreaming about her, and then starts seeing her around the house, sometimes as a very beautiful woman, the kind that appears in her dreams, and sometimes as a uh, corpse that is rotting and falling apart. I really enjoyed this. It is about killing parts of yourself to make society more accepting of you and how miserable that can make you feel. It's also quite ambiguous as well as to who the guest in the house is, whether it's Abby, whether it's the ghost, or whether something else is going on as well. There is a twist at the end. Yes, the ending is um, maybe not confusing, but can be interpreted in lots of different ways. I would encourage you to read this book quite slowly and not rush it. One, two, I guess, pay homage and respect to all the work that went into these illustrations, but also because I think that's how you're going to get the most out of it, given that there's quite a lot of subtext in here. Okay, final five books. At the very beginning of October, I read Charlotte Eichler's new poetry collection. This is called Swimming Between Islands. We were doing an event together online for Portobello Books. It's not one that you can watch back, so I can't link it in the description box, but if you have read please do not touch this exhibit or other work of mine and liked it, I can quite confidently say that you will like Charlotte's work too. We've done events together in the past because we write about similar themes, folklore, girlhood, would-be motherhood, and it was such a joy to chat to her and to have conversations about how our poems seem to be having conversations with each other. And I would like to read one to you because I think that's the best way for you to get a sense of what her writing is like. This is a poem called The Babies and the Dahlias. There are babies under our chairs, around our feet. We pick them up and put them on the table. They sit flower-faced and angry. When my boss and I aren't looking, they amble to the map room to paint our new world map. They use fingers to draw countries that we've never found. I secretly admire them, despite my boss. He tells me to organize my filing and use more yellow post-its. So I'm planning on the kitchen wall in pen. It leaves a greenish cloud above the light switch. The babies are covered in wet paint, writing slogans we will never understand. Outside, beyond the hedge, are purple dahlias I want to pick. My boss says I can if we hurry, but when we get there, it's the village show. Trestle cake tables covered in white food. We can't see the dahlias. Oh yeah, and here is just one stanza that I love as well. There's so much love in this book. Our children's veins were green lit, young trees with the smell of smoke already in their branches. It's lovely, 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 lovely. Then I read Two Trees Make a Forest by Jessica J. Lee. I read her nonfiction book Turning many years ago, which was about wild swimming and I absolutely loved it. Unfortunately, I didn't love this one as much and I was trying to think why. In this she's writing about the history of Taiwan and about the history of her family, looking at nature and place and belonging and narratives that tie all of those things together. But I think that for me there wasn't a, a strong narrative path directing the reader through all of these things and I per perhaps selfishly would have liked that. I think on a sentence or, or paragraph level there is so much to love but then when I step back and look at it as a whole it just didn't quite come together for me in the way her previous book did. So this one wasn't one that I loved as much as I'd hoped to. I then read In the Province of the Gods by Kenny Fries. This is a non-fiction book that just screams me, it screams Jen <laughs> because it's about Kenny travelling to Japan to research how disability is um, talked about in Japan but also to look at Japanese gods as well and he goes there as a disabled man and whilst he's there he also discovers that he's HIV positive so he's looking back on being a disabled person always being a disabled person and how he's viewed differently in both the states and Japan but then also learning this new thing about him which impacts his life even more and makes him reassess his health in a different way whilst also talking about Japanese gardens and Japanese gods and researching disability within Japan and he talked about, which leads me on to another book that I went and picked up, he talks about Katie O'Hearn who is um, a writer who lived in Japan for a very long time and researched and wrote about Japanese ghost stories and folklore. This is a collection of his that I've had sitting on my shelf for a very long time and I have picked it up on occasion and just wasn't really drawn to the writing. I think this is more interesting as a non-fiction book 
that's examining Japanese history as opposed to getting completely immersed in the storytelling. That's at least how I felt about it. But I didn't realise, and Kenny writes about this in his book because he comes quite obsessed with Hearn, is that Hearn was disabled himself, he's blind in one eye, and I think reading Kenny talk about Hearn and his stories made me appreciate this book more. This is never going to be a book that I love, the writing style just isn't to my taste, but I just saw it in a completely different light and it made me pick it up again and reread parts and I was grateful for that. But getting back to Kenny's book, this is definitely a book that I would recommend if you're looking for a book that's talking about queerness, that's talking about illness, that's talking about Japan and gardens and food. I, I guess the only thing I would say that I felt that sometimes Kenny was drawing parallels between things, between other people's experiences and his own that I didn't think were particularly helpful and he does actually acknowledge that it's not helpful to do those things but then would also continue doing it which I guess is just part of the human condition um but yeah I don't know that that's probably my only criticism I enjoyed the rest of the book very much the final book I read in October is Eddie and Dopey's book and this is Sipping Don Perignon Through a Straw Reimagining Success as a Disabled Achiever written entirely using my one good finger Eddie is a uh, amazing disability activist. He works for the United Nations, um, but this is looking at a very specific period of his life um, when he moved from South Africa to Oxford when he'd accepted a place there to study. And it's looking at the care system, looking at caregiving, looking at institutions and ableism within institutions and the refusal to understand disabled bodies and to really appreciate accessibility, not just have gaps in knowledge, but willfully ignore what disabled people are saying that they need. So the book really powerfully opens with Eddie being at Oxford with a carer who he calls carer number six. So we know there have been five before that. And his carer is helping him shower. And when he's in the shower, the fire alarm goes off and he knows that this is a drill. He'd received an email about it beforehand. So he tells his carer, could you just go outside and tell them, you know, I'm having a shower and I can't come out right now. And the carer says, no, I have to take you outside. He doesn't get Eddie dressed. He just throws a towel over him. Eddie still has shampoo in his hair. He completely ignores Eddie's protests, completely takes away his agency and pushes his wheelchair outside in the freezing cold. And it's just an experience that a lot of, particularly wheelchair users experience during fire drills, for instance, being left behind, not being able to leave buildings. So that is the opening. And then we go back in time when Eddie is applying to Oxford and then how Oxford accepts his application, but then further down the line, refuse to acknowledge the care he needs or provide it, even though that was all part of his application. So this is a book that is examining accessibility is looking at the limitations placed on disabled people by a society that refuses to accommodate us. This is a book that will get under your skin and make you angry, or at least I, I hope that it makes you angry. This is also a queer memoir as well. And yeah, I just thought it was great. So I would recommend that one too. So those are all the books that I read in October. As I said, I will list them in the description box down below. If you missed any of these titles, would like to be reminded of them. If you are new to my channel and you like this video and you would like to subscribe, that'd be lovely. If you enjoy my content and you would like to consider supporting on Patreon, that'd be very kind. Patreon is a place where you can support creators and the support that I receive over there allows me to keep creating free content for everybody on here, as well as funding my time, making it accessible by creating captions and all of that good stuff. As I mentioned at the very beginning of this video, if you would like me to fulfill a uh, book recommendation conundrum that you have, then leave that in a comment down below. I need a gift for this person in my life. They like these things and I will answer as many of them as possible in my video next week. So I will see you next Sunday for that video and I'm sending lots of love. Bye.